Sometimes our biggest obstacle is our own way of thinking. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Crows with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I just wanted to do a solo episode, something short. I know it's summer and uh, I appreciate having conversations with guests. When I originally started this podcast, it was meant to be just me, just me talking, sharing some thoughts. And I want to make sure that um, many of you are on break. Many of you are enjoying some time off. And so I wanted to make sure that I'm still creating some podcasts, sharing some thoughts with you, but I also wanted to honor my guests when I know more people tend to listen. So I thought I would just record something I've been thinking about, something a little bit shorter. And first of all, I hope that if you're listening to this, um, you're having a break, you're, you're doing something that you love doing. And I know that many people across the world listen to this. So um, to my friends in Australia uh, and other parts of the world, you, you might be right in the thick of school. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here and, and, and shout out to all the educators across the world who might be working. So I love using that shout out button. Anyways, um, I was just thinking about, uh, I was on Catlin Tucker's podcast recently and Catlin Tucker and I were talking about, um, the idea of like some of the barriers that we face in education and basically the, the, the idea behind innovate inside the box and acknowledging that, you know, we will always have constraints in our work. And sometimes those constraints were actually create ourselves. And it's not that we shouldn't continuously focus and recreate our systems to be so much better for every single kid. And I think we can do that continuously. I don't think there will ever be a time where we just say, hey, we're here. Like, I don't think anyone says, if we get to this point, we can stop. We always want to make things better for educators, for our students, for our communities. And so that's an ongoing process. And I think that's really important. But I think sometimes what happens is we hold ourselves back with our own, th- our own thoughts. And when Catelyn and I were talking, we were discussing this idea of, you know, what about universities that say we have to do certain things so we align our, you know, our, our practices towards them. So for example, we really focus on kids getting certain scores or doing certain classes so they can get into universities. And I understand that is something that we have to acknowledge. And I think some places are changing a little bit, but the thing that I think about often is the idea that I'm not waiting for other people to change their practice before I can change mine, before I can do something different. And this idea of creating it to believe it, to actually doing something that people can see, and then they're actually saying, hey, that's really good. Maybe we should change our practice. And I know that kind of seems idealistic, maybe overly optimistic, but I believe it's something we can actually do. And the example that I often give is about portfolios. Having portfolios, um, instead of you know having students that we look at them in a much more holistic manner, where we actually uh, see who they are, understand. And I, I've, I've shared this story about a student. Um, her name is Beverly Pham, and I was shared this by a teacher. And I actually found Beverly Pham on about.me. She was, uh, she was a highlighted creator on that page. And I had shown she was a student at the time. And I was showing uh, her incredible work. And her teacher actually reached out to me and said, hey, that's actually my student. And what's really interesting is that um, we actually had her make a page in class. And when she applied to school, uh, she didn't actually get in. Her, her grades are not good enough. So she contacted the school and she had them Google her. And once they Googled her, they wanted her to, to be in school. And so even though that, that college had a certain practice, they actually um, saw something different and saw such a much more whole about the kid, about the student at the time. And that student has now gone on, graduated from that school because they showed something different. And I've said this forever is that grades do not tell the story of a child, but we continuously try to tell the story only through grades for the next phase of their lives. And if you think about hiring practices, we often say, oh, what about grades? Well, I hired lots of people to work in school and never use grades, right? And so I think when we look at portfolios, we can create something much more holistic, much more uh, all encompassing of who our students are and not waiting for universities to ask us for this, but saying like, hey, this is something we're doing. This would probably be better to actually have an understanding of, you know, who's attending your school and who's getting into that space and and creating something different, right? And it's just one example of things you can do. But when I was talking to Catelyn, I had shared this story about Roger Bannister. And for those of you who don't know Roger Bannister, 
basically, he was the first person to break the four minute mile mark. And at the time, he was actually um, was striving to do this. And it was believed to be an impossible feat that nobody could ever break the four minute mile. In fact, um, from what I've been reading about it, people thought that if you ran that fast a mile, your heart would literally explode that um, you would die because it was just too ridiculous. And he kept striving for this and people thought, you know, the conditions had to be perfect. And on a day he actually had um, run the race conditions were it was cold. It was wet from, you know, what I've read, obviously I didn't see the race. It was a long time ago, um, but he broke the four minute mile. And all of a sudden, something that people believed was not possible, all of a sudden was proven to be possible. And when I talk about those practices in education, I think sometimes people will say, well, we can't do this because of this and this. And then, and then somebody does it, and then all of a sudden it becomes a norm. It becomes a practice. And the Roger Bannister story is really interesting because uh, it actually was believed that he couldn't do it. He wouldn't be able to do this. And it actually, I'm reading this, it said 46 days uh, after Bannister's feet, John Landy, an Australian runner, not only broke the barrier again, um, but he did it even faster. So what was perceived as impossible, basically all throughout human history, then was possible by another person 46 days later. And it's actually at the point, uh, as I'm recording this, 11 high school students have actually broken the four-minute mile barrier. So you see that once it is done, people now believe they can do it. And for me, this is always something that I've tried to do is like, you know, hey, you might not think I can do this, but I will. Uh, not only am I going to prove you wrong, I'm going to prove myself wrong. Because sometimes you have those doubts. Sometimes you, you, you're, you, you block yourself through these things. And if you think about even those who are closest to you, uh, a lot of times they might encourage you. And it's not because they have ill intent or anything. Um, but they will say like, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Or maybe that's too uh, far reaching of a goal. And I think about this um, in my own uh, life. Uh, many of you know I've lost a lot of weight. I've been really focusing on my health. And, and, and it's not the first time I've lost weight. Uh, I did years ago. And I basically, the first time I lost weight, I, I did it by running. I started running. And I was getting into running. And uh, I, I was going through the process. And just, you know, doing it for fun, doing it for exercise. And I was getting more and more into it. And so I didn't know much about running. I just, you know, would put on shoes and, and leave my house and go for a run. And I was actually at a gym one day and there was a sign uh, to register for a marathon. Now, I had never run a race. I'd never run anything maybe since I was a kid. And I was like a hundred meter dash or a hundred yard dash, things like that. Um, depending, <laughs> I, th I think it was a hundred yard because we were in Canada. I can't remember what it was. I know it was meters in Canada. Anyways. Uh, we were, I, I, that's probably the longest race I'd ever done before that. I remember we used to do the 12 minute test in school and I hated it. So running 12 minutes was like just horrible for me as a kid. And then I started running and all of a sudden I see this sign to sign up for a marathon. Now, I don't know anything about running. And what's interesting is I decided that day, yeah, I'm going to sign up. So I signed up for the marathon. I, I didn't know there was 5k races, 10k races, half marathons. I just thought it was marathon or, or nothing. And so here I am going through the process of losing weight and I sign up for a marathon. And for me, uh, I felt I could do it because no one was telling me anything different. No one was saying anything different. And so I, you know, uh, you know, practice just kind of did my own thing. I didn't sign up for any routine or anything like that. I uh, really didn't use the internet to research anything. I just knew I had this race and I thought, hey, I should, you know, try to get run longer distances. So the day of the race came and uh, I was actually running that uh, race and I was doing it. And I, I had no doubt, to be honest with you, because I had no idea that it was that long. I had no idea a hard to be it's just in my head that, Hey, you're entered this race. Now you're going to do this. And so if I would have probably listened to people at the time who known me that I struggled with weight all my life was never a runner. Uh, I probably would have never even signed up in the first place, but here I am signing up and it was really an, an awesome experience. The first marathon I'd ever run. 
And I think that when we're achieving some great things, it's also important to be humble and, you know, to think about uh, having humility through that process. And the reason I bring that up is during this race, I'm about 38 kilometers into the race and I'm feeling great. I'm just feeling awesome. And as, I, as I'm going through the race, as I'm going through the process, uh, I know I'm going to finish. I'm about four kilometers away. My legs are really tired, but I know, hey, you ran 38, you'll finish the last four. You got this. And all of a sudden, I had this feeling of just being invincible. Just, I, I remember actually talking to myself and, and just saying, like, you're amazing. Like, you are so awesome. And I was just just lifting myself up about thinking about how incredible I was. And I was, I think, 29 at the time, you know, 29 when I first ran my first race. And I had uh, done this and had this overwhelming feeling of just being awesome, just being incredible. And I remember um, as I'm running this race, having this feeling, uh, someone who was probably about a um, foot shorter than me, probably she was in her 70s or 80s, and uh, maybe weighed as much as me at the time, had just passed me and just went right by me. And I was thinking, wow, I, like I, my perceptions of, you know, what I can do and what other people can do, it's like, just always be humble, always be humble um, through this process. And really told me a lot about myself because I had this, this idea of, you know, what a runner looked like. I had a perception in my eyes. And really, if you run, you realize runners come in all shapes and sizes. They, um, a lot of people do really incredible things that we sometimes put in our heads that they can't do. And so I was actually thinking something in my head that other people might have thought about me. And so that humility of understanding that are we sometimes holding ourselves back, but are we sometimes in our minds holding others back and having that perception and being that person? I, when I think about my own kids, I always want to be the reason they try things. I always want to be the reason they, they believe they can succeed. And so I do that by, you know, instilling a certain confidence in them, but for, by trying things myself and going through that process. So as you're looking, as you're going into, um, as you're looking to go into this next year, and I think a lot of times we do the things that we believe others believe we can do. We let others set our limits. But I think really we achieve greatness uh, in our work, in our personal lives, when we set our goals and we don't let those constraints hold us back. We don't let um, the, per the perception of others hold us back, even the people that love us. And there's people that sometimes don't want us to see us get hurt. And like I said, not out of ill intent, but they just want us um, not to be disappointed. And I think for me, you set those goals really high and don't hold yourself back, you know, through that process, because a lot of times we can easily blame like, Hey, this person thinks I can't do it, but has that person got into your head? And actually, are you now holding yourself back? Are you holding yourself back through that process? Because I know that <laughs> I've achieved some great things, some things I'm really proud of in my life because I didn't know any better, because I had no one telling me that I couldn't do it. Um, and sometimes I've achieved some things I'm really proud of, even while people saying I couldn't do it. But it's really kind of training your mind to seeing what is possible, what you can create. And when I think of that Roger Bannister story, um, and how when we do this, when we do these incredible things, not only do we achieve something ourselves, but we inspire so many people to do great things in their work and i think this is a good lesson for ourselves and for our kids and um you know what do we model what do we model to one another because through that modeling it's not only about us achieving better things but it's all the people around us that we hope to inspire and that's kind of the purpose of education is elevating each other so thank you for just taking a little bit of time out of your day to listen to this podcast i appreciate all that you do i hope you're having uh, time to do exactly what you want to be doing at this moment. Take care. Have a wonderful day.